ओ नम शिवाय ओ नम शिवाय ओ नम शिवाय ओ नमस्ते वेदांतन्स I hope some serious Vedic scholars find this series uh, because it's the only one that I know of that goes into the Brahma Sutra and tries to actually explain it. <laughs> Most of them just present it and they skip over the commentary because it's too difficult. Well, we like a challenge. And in this particular sutra, Sutra 4, Adhikarana 4, this uh, is a challenge by the opposition, by the opponent. So you might ask, well, who could possibly be an opponent of the idea that aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, and tattvamasi, you are Brahman. <laughs> I mean, who could possibly be against that? Well, the answer is just about everybody. Even including so-called Advaitins, what we call Neo-Advaitins, who are actually dualists in disguise. See, and they're presenting Advaita as a sectarian religion. How is it because they are against the traditional interpretation of the scriptures? They are against sadhana, they're against study, they're against charity, they're against, you know, everything that actually gives results. And they're using as an excuse Shankaracharya's argument here, actually in this Adhikarana, that uh, Brahman and the scriptures that describe Brahman are not about actions. So one who has realized Brahman doesn't need to do any religious rites, doesn't need to do any work of any kind, you know, if they don't want to, uh, and so on. So they're using this um, ostensible attainment of uh, independent sovereignty through simple knowledge of Brahman, that Brahman exists, you know, they're using that as an excuse to evade all the customary disciplines and, you know, self-development leading up to it. So what you have is a kind of lopsided realization, you know, with <laughs> too much emphasis on oneness and not enough emphasis on how to present it and how to live it in the world. The other thing is, on a theoretical level, they try to make an object of Brahman. And this can be very subtle. Like, for example, if one says, well, one should meditate on Brahman. This is making Brahman into an object. Now, the Upanishads also do this, we agree, and some examples of this are going to crop up in this discussion as it goes on <clears throat> between the opponent and the Advaitin, that when the Upanishads prescribe meditation, they prescribe meditation on a deity. What is a deity? A metaphor or symbol for Brahman, because Brahman is imperceptible. It is that which perceives. So as the Upanishad says, how to know that by which all is known? How do you know the knower? And the answer is you can't. <laughs> it's ontologically impossible. <laughs> So, all right, the Vedas prescribe Aum. That's why we begin and end everything with Aum. Aum is the key. Aum is the symbol, this password 
that opens up a certain circuit in reality that allows Brahman to reveal itself. And you can become enlightened just by chanting Aum. You can become enlightened by meditating on Brahman as any one of so many symbols, fire, the sun, air, prana, intelligence, knowledge, consciousness, space. I mean, come on. One of our friends, <laughs> I'm so pleased about this. One of our friends recently started chanting Aum Namah Shivaya. And within, I mean, just a couple of days, Shiva gave him enlightenment. Some people are just lucky. <laughs> now, what can I say? When a person, a properly prepared person, who has already investigated into and meditated on the self, uh, receives a powerful tool like the Panchakshara Mantra, it has very quick results. It had very quick results with me uh, because I've had years of preparation. I went through everything, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, you know, raja yoga, mantra yoga, this yoga, that yoga, right? For years. And of course, the practice and all kinds of austerities and so on. So when I got a tool like, you know, Om Namah Shivaya, Oh, man, I mean, <laughs> Shiva's response was practically instant, just a matter of a few days. With the idea of understanding how the vrittikars in Shankaracharya's purport are actually the materialists and the phony Advaitins of today presenting Brahman as a duality, now, listen to Shankaracharya's comments and see, you know, how, first of all, the opponent presents himself. Others, example gradior vritikara, stand up here in opposition and say, though Brahman is known from scriptures alone, still it is presented as a factor involved in the injunction about meditation just like the sacrificial stake and the ahavaniya fire, which, though unknown in ordinary life, are presented by the scriptures as factors in injunctions. How can this be so? This can be so because the scriptures have in view either persuasion for or dissuasion from activities, as is declared by those who know the import of the scriptures. The obvious purport of the Vedas is to generate knowledge about duties. Shabara Bhashya 111. By injunction is meant a sentence impelling one to duty. Ibid 112. An instruction, that is, an injunctive sentence like, He shall sacrifice, is that which imparts the knowledge of these virtuous deeds. Jaimini Sutra 115. There, in the Vedas, words standing for established realities should be uttered with verbal terminations, etc. Ibid 1125. Since the Vedas are meant for enjoining duties, all the sentences that do not have that purport are meaningless. Ibid 121. So this is not only an attack on the non-dual nature of Brahman, because it says that Brahman can be meditated on, not indirectly by means of a symbol, but directly. They don't mention any symbol or anything. Although the actual passages in the Upanishads to which they indirectly refer do mention symbols such as fire, the sun, and the rest. So what's going on here? Huh? In the words of a, a great hippie leader uttered at the annual rainbow gathering way up high in the Sierra Mountains in 1994, 
Quit creating duality, man. They are making the non-dual dual. They are trying to make Brahman an object. And Upanishads declare that Brahman is never an object. They consider the fourth quarter of Brahman, Turiya, to be that which is not conscious of the internal world, nor conscious of the external world, nor conscious of both the worlds, nor a mass of consciousness, nor simple consciousness, nor unconsciousness, which is unseen beyond empirical dealings, beyond the grasp of the organs of knowledge and action, uninferable, unthinkable, indescribable, whose valid proof consists in the single belief in the self in which all phenomena cease, and which is unchanging, auspicious, and non-dual. That is the self, and that is to be known. Mandukyopanishad Mantra 7. So, forget about it. <laughs> Brahman is one. It will always be one. You cannot tease it apart into some duality. It is even, he says in this uh, shloka, uninferable. What the Upanishads do when they superimpose a symbol on Brahman is make it inferable. The symbol becomes the ground of the inference. And the conclusion is that Brahman exists and Brahman is the self. So the single proof of Brahman is the belief that I am Brahman, the self, myself, is Brahman. Because as soon as you adopt that belief, as soon as you believe in it wholeheartedly, Brahman reveals itself. So those who have not had that experience are the doubters, the vrittikaras, makers of a difference, a vritti, a modification of the original consciousness, non-dual consciousness, into duality, different forms of duality, like sushupti, jagrat, and svapna. And yeah, they're in svapna, all right. They're dreaming. <laughs> because no matter how many words you make about it, Brahman can never be made dualistic. Never, ever. So, <laughs> the actual proof is in the pudding. The actual experience is in the tasting. Just, you know, provisionally, for like a few minutes, set your doubts aside and wholeheartedly believe, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. And see what happens. Oh, that's sad. Oh, shocked he. Oh, oh, Namah Shivaya.